guest is the Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr. Senator Tarr, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? We're trying to stay dry, man. How about yourself? You know, it's, it's fairly dry down here in Putnam County. Uh, I saw those storms kind of, we had a risk of them, but I think uh, they went north of us and caught you guys. If you'd like, we could send some your way. We've got more than enough for ourselves. Uh, that's okay. We're still trying to dry out from last week a little bit. So. Yeah, man. How, are, how are things after that, Eric? Uh, yeah, they're, they're not terrible down here now. It's, uh, we don't have any flooding issues. We had a real concern down here that we would have. And so, uh, but we, it, uh, we were blessed to just miss us. All right, very good. Uh, I know we got some numbers yesterday with the conclusion of the month of March. How are the state's finances on this April the 2nd? Uh, we're doing really well relative to what um, was estimated, but, uh, you know, we do estimates a little different now. But so far this year, we're about $522 million ahead of estimates, 523 somewhere in there. Um, and for the month, uh, we ended up about $95 million over estimates. So it's uh, it's still looking pretty good. It's, I think it's going to hit the forecasting fairly closely from what we're seeing we're expecting. Um, you know, the governor's estimate uh, that came in for this one, uh, we, we expect to be somewhere um, around $750, $780 million in the surplus beyond revenues. And how will these numbers affect what uh, we expect will be a, a, a special session in May, Senator Tarr? Um, you know, one of the things that there's a few things we were looking at during session um, that created a lot of uncertainty. Um, one of them was a big political issue, as you all know, is the unemployment uh, reserve fund was um, becoming a big risk because some triggers that got implemented when the governor had put $600 million into the the unemployment reserve fund that set in place some triggers to start escalating costs to employers and also escalating the benefits amount so that we were paying out um, at a lot faster ratio than was being paid in. So we had to address that and get it stabilized, which is um, still still not fixed, but it's we're losing money slower than we were out of that fund, and so that, that's a, that one stabilized a bit. We also have potential for the trigger for an income tax cut uh, that could be as high as $250 million that um, could have kicked in and still could. And we had, uh, from month to month, um, a couple different of the financial advisors that we'd have come in, come in and give us where they thought that trigger would land, and it would vary anywhere from zero to $250 million. And so um, we know better when we get to May. Um, how close we get on that trigger, and so we'll we'll probably make some decisions around then. Um, and then uh, the PIA reserve, or not reserve fund, that's not the risk anymore, but the PIA cost going up as well is something that we have to keep an eye on still because of going back to the 80-20 split, which is where it should have been for a long time. Um, as that comes in, it has uh, some risk associated with it as well. So there's um, stepping into May, um, we can really, when it comes right down to it, is there was nearly about a billion dollars of issue. BRIM was another really big one that uh, we have some concerns with. And as we get closer to May, we see where those land out. So we have some unappropriated funds, and those unappropriated funds probably by, by that point are going to be in the neighborhood of somewhere around seven to $800 million. And so we can look forward on how to use those. I don't necessarily think we need to build the base with it at all. I think it, with uh, the strategy we've been using for the past few years um, under President Blair's guidance with uh, holding the flat budgets and then going in and using surplus funds as a way to spend money to save money or spend money to make money has really produced a, this, this economic boom we've been seeing in West Virginia being able to go in and make West Virginia competitive. And so I think we'll continue that strategy. Um, you know, the first time we got some money in our pockets, it's not the time to abandon it. As the session went along and different uh, bills were being proposed that were, had a price tag associated with them, a fiscal note, so to speak, there seemed to be momentum building toward these bills until they got to you. And then you seemed to be the no man in Charleston as this session progressed al along the way. Was that a role that was thrust upon you or were you the person with the most discerning look at the state's numbers? You know, it, it's a combination. So part of my job as finance chair is to is to look at what, um, one, the needs of the state are. Two is what the forecasted revenue come, comes in to meet the, the needs of the state. And then three, the priorities of the Senate caucus. Um, and so uh, President Blair and I will go in and have a lot of these discussions. You know, he's a former finance chair as well, so we both understand state budgeting really well. Uh, we'll go in and educate the caucus on 
um, where we think the state's going to land on revenue. We'll go in and look at what we would recommend for budgeting strategies. We look at, and then we have discussions on the priority of the caucus, um, and then let the caucus make the decision. Uh, you know, we have uh, 31, um, actually, actually now 30 members in our in our caucus uh, after expelling uh, Senator Carnes, so we did have 31. We have 30 members in our caucus um, that go through and look at those policy priorities relative to what you know what the spend and what the revenue growth is going to be probably over the next five years. What we already have committed with statutes we've passed. Um, after that, then once they give me that with those walking orders, then it becomes incumbent upon me to remind them of that commitment. Um, so you know every every legislator up there has a priority that probably has money associated with it. And they bring that up. And so if, if I don't keep a close eye on what those priorities of the caucus were at the beginning of session and moving through session, then those, those priorities can fall apart if we do everything that feels good to spend the money. And so that's where I become the no guy is when it comes down to making sure that we can meet those priorities. Because if I don't say no, uh, then, frankly, none of the priorities will be met. John? Have the <clears throat> the four hundred sixty five million dollars that came into play with a potential clawback uh, early on, kind of a ripple effect, and then kind of the thought was well, sort of an administrative confusion uh, because the rules changed went along. Has that all been accounted for? Is that kind of now stable? We don't going to have to give that money back. What we have is a verbal um, from um, a verbal from the Fed to the governor's office is the way it's been described to us, but we don't have anything in writing yet. And so that, that, um, is actually 365 million, the 365 million that was there as a potential clawback, um, had to do with the ratio of spending in education as a ratio of spending to any other agency we had in government. So, um, they, they call it a maintenance of effort. And so one of the things that we had been doing, um, as, I'm sure everybody's aware we've been spending a lot of money on secondary roads, more than historically than West Virginia ever has out of general revenue. Because normally it's funded out of uh, out of things you see out of registration, car registrations, gas tax, and those things. Well, we've been putting in hundreds of millions of dollars out of general revenue in secondary. Well, that increases the spend, for instance, in the division of highways. Um, we've had significant growth uh, beyond what I would have liked to have seen in our um, spending what used to be DHHR, but it's in our healthcare agencies that just ballooned up. Um, what the education spend in West Virginia is controlled by a formula. It's formulary. And so what would happen is there's only a few things that we can go in and really increase the spend from the state side without dramatically changing the spend at a local level because of what's called a state share and a local share. That's very different from a lot of the states in the country. And so what happened is is that you didn't see the state spend grow on the public education side relative to the one-time spends we could make um, in a lot of these other agencies. And so that maintenance of effort had a difference of about $365 million. And so the feds come back and said that if we did not go in and show that maintenance of efforts of spend by the end of 2023 – that there would be a clawback. And so what were the, – the governor's office has requested a uh, variance, which they had got a variance once before on this because of that formula, that we could do other types of spins that would, uh, that would qualify for that maintenance of effort. So one of the things we did this session is we put $150 million more into the school building authority. It was a one-time appropriation. We have high confidence that that $150 million will be accepted by the federal government as part of that means of effort. That's just one example. What we don't have is a letter from the federal government saying, yes, it's accepted. So it's not – we can't say with confidence. Just think about what in your own pocketbook if you made a spend that may have to be clawed back from your family, and um, it's in the tens of thousands. You can't go in and spend that tens of thousands until you know for sure they're not going to claw it back from you somehow. And that's kind of the situation the state's in right now. So is this 150 million dollars money that <clears throat> excuse me money that we would not have spent had we not gotten word about the potential clawback or is that money that was already spent it just had to be re recategorized? No, it's, it's money we we appropriated this year in order to try to help with that maintenance of effort because there's two things that have to happen one is they have to accept it 
as part of that maintenance of effort. And two, they have to accept it after the end of the uh, fiscal year 23. So it's outside of that spending time frame that we were permitted. So there's a couple of things that have to, to have to hit and for the feds to let that qualify. Uh, the pay raise that went into effect, the teacher's portion of that pay raise this year would be something that could potentially um, reduce that clawback. But again, it's outside that 23 spend, so they have to prove it for that as well. Um, several other things like that as well. So we, we think that um, the, the HOPE scholarship, there are several things that all apply, but they're outside the spending time frame and they're potentially outside the guardrails of what they would have allowed toward that permitted spend for the maintenance of effort. All, we need all that back in writing. That's, you know, from from president's point of view, from my point of view, I think from, and I can't speak for the House, but the discussion's been in, I think from their point of view as well, that, you, you know, we want to know with confidence that we're not going to go and spend money we think we have, and the government comes back, federal government comes back and says, no, you don't have that money, that call back. So, um, so you can't, we don't want to spend it twice, in other words. Just one more, to get ahead of our, our Facebook feed here with with the surplus money that we're talking about and why not just increase teacher pay more well you know the the one of the things that um we've done is we've we've given pay raises now um across all public employees for five years in a row um that is historic i don't think anybody can go back in our current lifetime and go back and find where beyond the normal increase because there's a normal increase every year anyway a step it's called a step increase beyond that step increase every year that's already in code i don't think you'll ever be able to find back where we went back and applied five years worth of pay raises in a row in west virginia and the republicans have done that the president's actually been a very um um He's been one of the biggest advocates for that. He and I have some some pretty heated discussions back and forth, especially this year, on whether to do it. One of the discussions around that with regards to the maintenance of effort is that what they were looking at is one-time spends count. When we do the teacher's pay raises, that's perpetual. You know, One of the other things you will not find when you go back, you're not going to go find where we've reduced the pay to teachers. And so if you do a pay raise that – say, is uh, worth um, $80 million to teachers. That's $80 million from now to whenever. And so it adds up year after year. So you could wipe out that entire 365 with the first pay raise we did if they would count it. So there's some debate whether or not we want to apply that outfit or will they accept that repetitive pay that goes in there. Um, and as we, we go through, we expect that you know uh, going forward, beyond those pay raises that we did with just those five years in a row, we're going to have income tax cuts that, that are significant. You know, they could be up to $250 million a year. And those are pay raises for teachers, too, as well as everybody else in the state. Matt Miller. So, Senator Tarr, I know that the federal government moves at a snail's pace, and so you are waiting on a letter to say it is official that you won't have to kick money back to the federal government. Do you expect that to happen within the next month, or is that still going to affect any special session in May if you don't have that in writing? You know, I, I don't know. Um, that's, that's a good good question. What I do know is that the communication back and forth between um, the governor's office and the, the, the U.S. Department of Education, which is where these conversations are going back and forth between, has been ongoing. So um, they're both by telephone calls and then also some email exchanges back and forth, wanting changes and uh, um, questions and things like that. So it's not like we're there, there's a question that's asked and five minutes later we're getting an answer. There's an ongoing conversation back and forth. So I think that once um, they get all their boxes checked, we'll probably get an answer. I don't know if we'll have it by May. Um, you know, it's, but if not, those surplus dollars remain there. Um, one of the things that we, we do supplementals out of, and this is one of the things I think uh, journalists certainly get confused by it because uh, I'm having to answer these questions frequently from them, and I'll have to go in and correct sometimes what they'll say. Um, but uh, even legislators get confused on the, the different pools of money that the, we spend of the taxpayers' dollars. One of those pools of money is money that is unappropriated surplus. It goes all the way back to 1863. You know, if there's a, a, a fiscal year that dollars weren't spent, then it adds into that pool of money. And so 
just because we don't spend it in May doesn't mean it doesn't get spent at some forward time. And that's one of the really things we've changed on how we, we uh, approach budgeting in the state, especially this year, is that we now have uh, – the governor even did it this year. He gave two revenue estimates if you paid close attention. One of the things he didn't give an, an estimate on is what that unappropriated surplus is I just described. But one of the things that is fundamentally different than we typically have seen in years past is he said – he gave a revenue estimate of $5.22 billion for his base budget. And then he said, but on top of that, we also have a revenue estimate of $780 million in surplus. Well, if you add that up, that revenue estimate is $6 billion. But typically what you would have seen in years past is he would, the governor would have come in and said, we have a revenue estimate of $5.22 billion, and then anything past that is going to be surplus. And we're just going to put these items in surplus, but we don't know what that's going to be or if there will be any. The reason we have that fundamental difference is that because of us going in and following the president's direction, President Blair's direction on holding flat budgets for four years, that put us into a situation of starting to get into surplus. We applied that surplus spend to those, that philosophy I said before, spend money, one-time money where it, either, it makes you or saves you money. And that allowed us to get an economic renaissance started in West Virginia so that we have a diversification of the revenue that comes into the state government now that is stronger than our severance revenue. And, and that's allowing us to have economic growth so much so that we need to control the base spend to allow that to perpetuate. And by doing that, you can actually estimate your surplus revenue to apply those one-time spends to. So you essentially run two budgets now. And not only do you run two budgets, because we meet so often and can overlap our a special session over top of an interim session for those three days and run bills and run s supplemental items, we, go, we, can, we can closer estimate in a time frame those spends. We don't have to estimate 18 months out, which has been historic West Virginia. We can come in and say, you know what, we're going to be back in in three months, and if we need to do this spend in three months, we'll do it then. We don't have to go ahead and estimate it out 18 months ahead. So there's some fundamental changes in the way we budget, um, and it's a, it's a big change, I think, for the people that follow finances in West Virginia over the years relative to when we had, uh, we're living paycheck to paycheck because we are not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. As the governor's office sets the agenda for the special session, have they reached out yet to you and the Senate leadership and uh, the House leadership as well in kind of laying out what they want to accomplish, or, or is this going to simply come from the governor himself? We've had uh, ongoing discussions through session, um, not, not so much since session, um, but through session in, the I'd say, the last three uh probably three weeks or so of it um maybe four we would meet weekly or bi-weekly um coming down between um senate leadership house leadership and the governor's um executive team would come down and meet with us and we would go over where we would where we thought we'd be for session and then what things we thought we may need to consider coming back in may um once we had uh, a better idea where a lot of these things land but but I don't think that discussion has really changed any since then. Um, so uh, you know I expect to come back in May uh, when it gets closer to that we'll be sitting down at the table again to see what the priorities would be between the two bodies and the governor's office to see what would be on that special session. Eric Tarr, our guest, he is the West Virginia Senate Finance Chairman, and uh, the state of course uh, sitting on a surplus. The uh, month of March went well also, another surplus uh, for the state of West Virginia. A as you move forward uh, this year and into next year, Eric, with a new governor at uh, some point along the way, uh, do you have a preference as to which of the candidates should be the next governor in West Virginia? You know, um, I think that any one of the, the four that's sitting up there are going to have um, – they're, I think they're going to be engaged with both the House and the Senate and have good relationships with both bodies. And my hope is is that whoever takes that seat also becomes a strong operator within the executive agencies so that we can get a lot of this um, the stuff that is kind of an uncontrolled inflationary driver to state expenses just come from the finance chair seat that they go in and take a strong hand with that because we've have, been having to do that from the legislature and it should be done from the executive branch. 
So I'm um, hoping to see whoever does it does that. Um, I think we got uh, four gig candidates. I'm not going to jump out in front for any one of them at this point. Um, but I'll be supportive of any one of those that get in there to try to keep uh, this renaissance from West Virginia moving forward. How much influence, and we know the governor in his state of the state speech sets some priorities of how he wants money to be spent, but in regards to the power to do so, how much influence does the governor actually have over how the money gets budgeted and spent by the time the legislature, both in the House and Senate, are done with a budget? You know, it's um, the governor's influence is strong in that he has the, the executive branch has uh, it's very powerful in West Virginia and it's made powerful by the Constitution. Um, so the political influence from that power is strong. The reality is, if the legislature decides that with, with this mega majority we have, if we decide that with that power will rest with us and rest with us entirely, then it can rest with us entirely. Uh, the legislature's not really hasn't hasn't made that that strong of decision to go that way. Um, at least in my tenure up there, um, I've argued that that's what we should do. I think this budget came the closest it ever has to that. Is that we came in instead of working off of the governor's introduced budget of the state of the state, which was just a um, a fantasy. Um, it tried to spend every penny that you could find anywhere. What we did is we went back and worked off of the budget that was ran last year. We looked at what we we knew the growth in spend could be, which is about an average of 3% per year, and we worked back from that. And then um, we essentially passed our budget built from that because of what was handed down from the governor, which just um, it was an explosion in growth that would have wiped out all of the conservative uh, spending control that we've been implementing over the past several years. So this year became the closest to it, where the legislature exerted their influence stronger than they ever have, at least in my tenure up here. Um, and I think that the new governor coming in, uh, the closer they work with the legislature, the more influence they'll have. I think if they try to come in and bully the legislature, they'll find the legislature um, takes more and more control of that budget. Senator Tarr, final word is yours. I appreciate your time this morning. Hey, uh, well, I, I uh, um, appreciate you guys having me on. I tell you what, I can't say enough about the leadership that you guys sent down to Charleston there with Senate uh, President Craig Blair. I can promise you from sitting from this seat, we would not be enjoying these times in West Virginia had it not been through his leadership. So uh, appreciate you guys sending me to Charleston. Appreciate your comments, sir. Thank you kindly. All right. Have a great day. You too.